touch it? Yeah. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. You know, I, I didn't realize it's the day after Yom Kippur, so um, we had a busy 25 hours, but I'm very grateful that everyone's here today. And I wish everybody a healthy year with uh, shalom in your hearts and uh, a lot of great health and love. Uh, tonight is a, is a wonderful discussion uh, that's pertinent to us uh, here in City District 5. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, moderator, Jackie Karsh, a member of uh, the Sinai community, and two outstanding candidates uh, who will give you their hearts, give you their souls. Uh, they're both fantastic, and let me just share a little secret. Uh, in this community, you know, we want to share both points of view. Uh, for everyone here to make their own decisions on who can uh, bring wonderful leadership to us. And by the way, they're both wonderful. So um, I want to encourage everybody to also think of some questions tonight to ask them. Um, in addition, what's going to be t different tonight's discussion is, um, and I'm not going to take any of Jackie's thunder, but we're going to bring up something very near to the Jewish community of anti-Semitism, which uh, you know, we're proud to bring up and we feel that's important, not only for the Jewish folks in Los Angeles, but for everyone. So uh, without uh, further ado, let me bring uh, Rabbi Sherman for a, a drosh to us, and then we'll uh, pass it to Jackie Garsh. Uh, good evening, everyone, to uh, everybody here online and in person. Uh, it's really an honor to uh, stand in a sacred place to have sacred conversation, uh, not just about the things that happen in this, in this community, but as Rabbi Wolfie likes to say, what we do here should be heard outside of the walls, and what we do outside of the walls should in fact be brought inside. That's exactly what we're doing uh, this evening, not just looking at signs, that I love both of your signs on many lawns, uh, but to actually hear from the, from the people as well. And so the Devar Torah is a famous one that we really repeat over and over, but I think it's as uh, apropos right now as it ever is, especially especially as the Jewish community worldwide came together uh, yesterday on Yom Kippur in a really magnificent way that we haven't seen in many years. And so, of course, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai, people who had very opposing views, but they could have conversation. And that uh, rabbis teach us, Eilu Eilu divrei Elohim chayim. These words and these words are both the words of the living God. And why were they able to converse? Because each was able to hear each other's opinion before they gave their own. And so I'm really honored to... Uh, uh, host, uh, Sinai Temple hosts this debate within the Sinai Temple Men's Club with Katie Yaroslavsky, Sam Yebri, and Sinai Temple's own, we like to claim her as their own, Jackie Karsh, who uh, when we were on the playground dropping off our kid, they said, how about coming to a men's club and uh, <laughs> event and debating? And she said, actually, I'd be honored. So I know this has taken away uh, time from her family, but I know it's also a really a meaningful thing for her to do in the larger Los Angeles Jewish community. So welcome, welcome online, and uh, we're mighty in person and even mightier out in the walls as well. So thank you, Jackie, thank you, Katie, thank you, Sam. The only thing I need is a, a coin of some right sort. Here. Okay. Yeah. So while well, Michael is, is doing the coin flip, I'll just start, I guess. Uh, yeah. What would you like, Miss Katie? Uh, it has two heads. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh. We lost okay, it. That's, that's <laughs> We're off to a good start here. <laughs> Pick a number, one or... No, it's right, I see it, it's right here. It's right here. Oh my god, that's horrible. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to do that again. Okay, here we go. You want this? Uh, heads. Uh, it's tails. Oh. Just to verify. It's tails. <laughs> okay, all right, well, Sam, you're first. But um, my name is Jackie Karsh. I'm a multimedia journalist here in Los Angeles. I'm also a Sinai parent and temple member, and I'll be tonight's moderator. 
We're going to assume that everyone here tonight is familiar with Katie and Sam, but maybe not familiar with how they stand on certain issues. So we're going to forego introductions and just assume that everyone watching tonight knows who you are. There are some house rules. We have three main categories that we'll cover tonight, followed by rapid fire questions and ending with some questions submitted by the audience. We flipped our coins. We know Sam is going first. Both of you will get a chance to respond to the same question with two minutes. We will allow for one reactionary response if you are called out by your opponent. But first, let's set the scene. The 5th District has approximately 275,000 residents covering Westside communities such as Bel Air, Cheviot Hills, Rancho Park, and Westwood and Hancock Park, and the Fairfax District to the east. It includes notable city landmarks like LACMA, the La Brea Tar Pits, the Grove, Beverly Center, Century City, UCLA, Farmers Market, Westwood Village, and of course, Sinai Temple. With that, Sam, let's begin with crime and public safety. Among likely voters, 40% said crime and public safety were their top concern going into this election. Crime is up more than 4%, with the city reporting almost 400 murders in 2021. What is your plan to rein in this crime wave? Thanks for the question, Jackie. Thank you, Rabbi Sherman and Michael, for organizing and for the entire Sinai community. This is the most important issue, because if we're not a safe community, we cannot be an affordable one, a healthy one, a green and vibrant one. And we're all really worried about what's happening in our streets. We're seeing all types of crime. And what distinguishes me from my opponent is I'm not just gonna tell you that crime is important to me and fighting it in public safety. I actually have a record. And that's why the police officers and firefighters of Los Angeles have endorsed me. In 2013, I went through LAP, 2018, I went through LAPD's Citizen Academy so I can understand how our city's police and how we can improve it. In 2013, I served on our city's gun violence prevention task force under our city attorney. I served on the board of the Anti-Defamation League to fight hate crimes of all kinds, including anti-Semitism, and I served as the public safety chair for my community here in Westwood. Uh, and I'm gonna hit the ground running on public safety. First thing we need to do is increase and rebuild our LAPD force. We're down to 9,200 officers for a city of four million. We have to get back to 10,000. When, when I was a city commissioner under Mayor Viragosa, we need to add more women officers to deal with domestic violence calls and mental health calls. We have to get 462 police officers that are behind a desk out patrolling. And then second, we have to end the lawlessness that's taken root in Los Angeles. There must be consequences for crime, and while we do not control our district attorney, we do control our city attorney. We must prosecute criminal misdemeanors, including property theft and hate crimes. And, and third, we have to partner with neighborhoods, with neighborhood watch groups, invest in technology, emergency preparedness. We have to invest in programs we know will prevent crime, like after-school programs and job training. And finally, we must end street encampments. Every single night, five Angelinos are dying on our streets, and we're seeing an increase in crime by people who are unhoused, but also against people who are unhoused. I say it's not progressive, it's not humane to allow people who are homeless to continue to suffer wither way and in increasing numbers overdose on our streets. We have to move them indoors with urgency and there's a real nexus with crime. Are you gonna flash when I'm here, almost done with time? That's or? Michael. Okay, uh, so with that, you know, uh, because of my policies, because of my background in this work, that's why I'm endorsed by the police officers and firefighters and first responders of Los Angeles. Katie, what is your plan to rein in crime? So we all, deserve to be safe in our communities. Uh, I'm a mom, I've got three young kids, and I understand that nothing is more important than making sure we're all safe, all of us and our families are safe. Uh, and it doesn't feel that way in LA right now. And, so I support a well-staffed, well-funded, well-trained, accountable police department where officers every day, day in and day out, are doing the work that they went to the academy to do. Right now we have hundreds of officers who are spending most of their time on nonviolent mental health calls, on homelessness response, when social workers and mental health care professionals are much better suited to addressing the needs of the populations they're serving. So we need to shift officers away, get them back, sorry, get them back out on the street and focused on the work that they went to the academy to do. We have officers on desk duty, we have officers doing what they're not supposed to be doing. And so once we hire social workers, mental health professionals, we'll free them up to go do the job that they're supposed to be doing. Having officers out on the streets, eyes and ears on the streets, 
getting back to community policing, where they're establishing long-term relationships with communities and neighborhoods. That's how we start to make our neighborhoods safer. It also helped with reducing response times. Uh, I support um, a well-funded 911 dispatcher service. No one should ever be put on hold when they call 911. Um, so that's incredibly important to me. And then also in the long term, it's very important that we're investing in all of the communities of Los Angeles. Public safety is a regional issue that requires regional response. And so even though we live in CD5 and or work in CD5, um, crime is, is, is coming from other parts of, of the region as well. And so we need to be investing in all of the council districts, all of the 88 cities that make up Los Angeles County. So to me, that means uh, affordable housing, workforce and job trainings programs, um, affordable health care, high quality education, opportunities so that people have alternatives. And that's how, in the long term, how we create truly sustainable, healthy, safe communities. You both mentioned, I'm, I'm not going to use this microphone because you don't. Uh, you both mentioned increasing the number of LAPD off, active LAPD officers, but a self described police abolitionist is the city council member elect for District 1. How can you make any meaningful change if you're elected city council member working with someone like that? Yeah, please, sorry. So the new council is going to be interesting, and we're going to have five new council members potentially, depending on what happens across the city um, in the upcoming elections. And to me, good policy making is about compromise and meeting people in the middle. And while there are certainly things that the council elect, council member elect, and I won't agree on, um, I think we can both agree that it's going to be important to continue to accelerate investments in our communities. That's something that she cares about. That's something I care about. I'm committed to making sure we have enough officers out on the street. We don't have that right now. That's a place where we disagree. And so I think, you know, when you're one of 15 on the LA City Council, it's really important that you're collaborative, that you find places of overlap in the Venn diagram with each of your 14 colleagues, and you focus on those areas of overlap um, while um, strongly uh, continuing to advocate for your position where you're different. And, and having been in government, I know what it takes to build coalitions, to problem solve, um, to find areas of collaboration, to build consensus outside from the community to push something through, um, and really lean on my colleagues in areas where I, I'm passionate, and this is one of those areas. So this is an area where Katie and I disagree. Uh, where there's areas where we can compromise and work with your colleagues, we should all do that. But one area where we should not be playing politics, we should never compromise, is our public safety. I've been knocking doors every day for the last couple months, and families of all backgrounds throughout this district tell me they don't feel safe. They don't feel safe, and I see a young boy here, Jacob, they don't feel safe taking their kids to their park. They don't want to have to navigate encampments next to their school. And when it comes to the police budget, when it comes to the number of police officers, I'm not going to negotiate and try to find a way. We have to get back to where we were under Mayor Viragosa. In 2013, we were the safest big city in America. And I served under him, and my role as a city commissioner was to design the policies where we would re recruit and train our police officers. And we have to get back to 10,000 officers. We're down 800, and every single day we're losing more and more officers. And we're seeing what that means. Uh, businesses are getting broken into every single night. I just got an alert that that big uh, that some of our favorite ice cream places on, on in the Rancho Park area were broken into over the weekend. And uh, down Motor Avenue, you've seen Westwood Village become largely ghost town because of the homelessness and crime and because of lack of leadership. Um, we And I've taken on the council member elect who wants to abolish the police. You cannot compromise with people who want to eliminate police officers. It's not about the, with her and people like her, it's not about the number of officers or the budget, it's about they don't want people with guns protecting us. And I think that's insane. And because of it, I've been called Hitler, my wife who's here has been called Ava Braun. I think we need leaders who are gonna stand up to the insanity that is at risk of taking over City Hall. Just a few months ago, while debating whether or not we should have encampments next to our schools, council members were bum rushed in City Hall. And several council members said it felt like January 6th in the heart of Los Angeles, in downtown LA, and that has to end. We need fierce leaders who will protect our neighbor, our neighborhoods, our families, and our kids. And that's what I intend to do. And that's why I've earned the endorsement of the people that whom we trust to run the line of fire for our families, our police officers, and our firefighters. Thieves are becoming more brazen. There is daytime looting, smash and grabs, or follow-home attacks. The theory goes there are limited to no consequences. 
Should we re-examine Prop 47, the $950 minimum for felony charges for incident? And Sam, you're first. A absolutely. I, I, for one, I voted for it. It was told it was going to be the Safe Neighborhoods and Safe Schools Act. The idea was we don't need to spend so much money on jails and policing uh, and prisons. Let's invest that money in schools and give people alternatives to incarceration. Sounds great in theory. What happened was, first of all, no money's gone to schools meaningfully. And now any nonviolent property theft, any break-in, that were less than $950 is stolen is treated as a misdemeanor. We've lost the leverage to actually force people to do the right thing, to prosecute them. And taking away the felony means that prosecutors and judges can't send people to, to treatment. If it's an addiction issue or someone's breaking in to, uh, to deal with their addiction, we don't have that leverage anymore. So we have to reevaluate Prop 47, the same thing with Prop 57, and the same thing with cash bail. The police officer says, why should I endanger my life running after a criminal who committed a crime if I know they're going to be back on the streets the same day. And I've heard stories from the ranking officers I've spoken to that the same criminal has been at in and out after a smash and grab, sometimes dozens of times in the same month. And then we get to the prosecution side, right? If we all want alternatives to incarceration, not every crime needs to lead to jail time, but violent crimes, recidivists, recidivists and other forms of, of, of and other crimes like hate crimes must result in criminal consequences, right? Otherwise, we'll see the lawlessness throughout Los Angeles continue to get worse. For those for whom it's an addiction issue, for whom we need a second chance, we all want to be compassionate. But at some point, their lawlessness in our city must end. And, if, and, and Prop 47 and 57, we as the voters implemented, so it's gonna come back to us as voters, and I will lead the charge to get it right. I don't know if it's a matter of the amount, of, of the amount if the 950 needs to ele be elevated, or if it's about discretion, I trust our prosecutors, I trust our judges to do the right thing, to make that call, knowing the totality of the facts. So LA feels lawless in a lot of ways, right? You're talking about smash and grabs, and um, just the general sense that there aren't consequences for um, breaking the law. And I think 47 has created some unintended consequences, uh, or maybe they were intended. Um, at some point, when you keep breaking the law, even if it's a misdemeanor, um, you need to be punished. And as Sam mentioned, we haven't provided alternatives for people, so we just keep letting people out and go out and do it all over again. And, um, that's not okay. And so I think what we, what we need to be doing is at some point prosecuting people and also at the same time creating programs and pipelines um, to opportunity and doing both of those things at the same time. But until we start holding people accountable for their actions, it's just going to keep getting worse. Governor Gavin Newsom recently vetoed a bill that would have allowed the opening of supervised injection sites for drug users in Los Angeles. Do you support local action to authorize safe injection sites? And Ms. Katie, please go. So I think with the right conditions and the right um, systems in place to make sure that impacts are minimized, safe injection sites can be a useful tool because they can keep people from dying. Um, there are lots of concerns about that because it seems to sort of put the government stamp on something that's otherwise not allowed, uh, which I'm uncomfortable with. And siting issues and where you're gonna put it is also a concern. Um, so I do think that if properly thought through, this is a way we can save lives. Um, the devil's always in the details, um, and I think we need to be doubling down on making sure that um, we're providing um, rehab and, and really trying to help people into um, uh, addiction centers to, to sort of break the habit. Um, but sometimes that can be a doorway in, you bring people in and then you have them there and you can help um, turn them towards um, alternatives and, and moving away from addiction. So I'm open to it, but I have reservations. Yeah. So I think it's one of the hardest questions we've both been asked as candidates. Uh, at first blush, I thought I, th I thought it was crazy to for the government to get in the business of giving people drugs right, and helping them inject. Uh, but I've, as I've spoken to not advocates, not activists, but people whose family members died, and they told me that and we've, I'm thinking of a close friend that Leigh and I know uh, who told me that her brother would be alive today if something like this existed. And I've, on every hard policy decision, you know, I, 
think of our Jewish teaching, Rabbi Sherman, right, that you can save a life, you save the world. Um, if we can save lives done right, um, if it's a pathway to getting people on the way to treatment and rehab and mental health care and psychiatric care, um, if done in the right places with the right nonprofits, um, with the right safeguards and a pilot program, I think it could work. And it's especially if you couple it with other things that are in the pipeline. For example, what Governor, Governor Newsom did do is that he advanced and signed uh, the care courts, which is now a non-criminal pathway for people who are homeless to get more than a three-day hold if they're on the brink of, of overdosing or dying, but to potentially six-month uh, six uh, hold uh, for people to get the help faster, get them so that we don't have to meet the, the current law right now is you have to meet a very high standard by which you could be conservative or institutionalized before you overdose. You have to be imminent harm to yourself or someone else or really disabled, and this will create a different pathway. People get to help faster, and you couple that also with anti-camping ordinances, which really transition people from living in places where they should be, like next door schools or next door our libraries or in our parks. Um, we need to create urgency, and I do think that people for too long who are homeless have been saying no to housing, to shelter, to care, to services, and if, if this is something that'll help them say yes, and we get them indoors and connect them with really good nonprofits, it's worth pursuing. All right, well, you transitioned us to the next topic, which is homelessness, and by far the most asked about by all the audience that RSVP to this. Homelessness is the biggest topic in Los Angeles in 2022. Six years ago, the city passed Proposition <coughs> HHH. The implementation has been plagued by cost overruns and delays. Angelinos are understandably frustrated. Why should they trust you to do it any differently? And Sam, you're first. Great question. I, like everyone in this room and everyone I've spoken to about these issues, we're frustrated and we're angry, and we want to see results. So Prop Triple H is a billion two bond that we voted for as voters. There's Measure H. Together we spent two billion dollars per year on a homelessness crisis. We're spending upwards of eight or nine hundred thousand dollars to build a single unit of homeless housing. What have been the results? What are we getting with all that money? Homelessness in CD5 over the last seven years has gone up 175% nearly triple. We cannot continue the same approaches. So I'm not a career politician. I'm not here to carry the water of the political machine. I don't come from this system. I think our system is broken. I think our colleagues at the county have broken our mental health system. They're not doing a good job. We can't continue to spend this kind of money to build brand new construction housing. We have to invest in interim housing options. We have to invest in building psych hospitals and interim care uh, addiction centers. We have to get back to more boarding cares throughout Los Angeles. I want to replicate what UCLA Health wants to do at Olympia and Fairfax, not too far from here, which is turning Olympia Medical Center into a psych hospital. That'll be 200 beds. We need to reverse what Reagan did 40 years ago and rebuild more mental health hospitals. That's our only way out of this. We cannot build our way, out of, uh, way, or build our way out of this homelessness crisis. We can't arrest our way out of it. And it's not a resource problem. It's a management problem. For too long, career politicians have been throwing more and more money with the same approaches, and it's just not working. And the proof is five Angelinos every single night are dying in our streets despite a historic amount of money that we're spending on this problem. So we have to invest in cheaper, faster options. We have to get folks into mental health care and addiction centers, and we have to clear street encampments because it's not humane and not progressive to allow people to live like that when we can get them indoors and save their life. Kate. So the biggest strength I'll bring to this job is my experience. So I spent a decade in the private sector. I was a land use attorney and then the general counsel of a climate change nonprofit. So I understand the private sector and what it brings to the table. And I also spent six and a half years working at the county for one of the supervisors focused on climate change and sustainability, arts of the creative economy, um, and public health for a few months during COVID. And so I understand the private sector, the public sector, and that homelessness more than just about any other issue is a regional issue. I talked about it in the context of public safety, but homelessness is a regional issue and it's gonna require regional solutions. And the way I think about how we solve for it is really in four buckets of work. The first is prevention. More people become unhoused every day than we get off the street and connected to housing and services. And so until we slow the rate at which people are falling in by keeping a roof over people's heads in the first place, we're never gonna get our arms around this problem. Fortunately, we know which populations are overrepresented in our unhoused population, right? Youth aging out of the foster care system, seniors on a fixed income, come, people coming out of jail, LGBTQ youth and seniors. 
they're more represented in the unhoused population. And fortunately, they are already accessing, for the most part, government services through the county. And so we know who these people are. And when we just do an additional touch every couple of months to make sure that they're going to have a roof over their head, we keep people housed. So one is prevention. And we haven't spent nearly enough money on prevention. HHH was a failure because it focused too far downstream. We need to be focused upstream. Second, we need to be doing a much better job of getting people who are on the streets now off the streets quickly with urgency, intelligently, and connected to housing and services. Adaptive reuse of motels and motels. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of them all over C5. We drive by them all the time on Los Angeles. We don't even realize they're there. We can very quickly and inexpensively convert them to homeless housing and affordable housing. Rent vouchers. We're going to deploy rent vouchers. There no, there's no reason why the federal government alone should be doing giving rent vouchers. We can take otherwise market rate housing and make it affordable by giving people a voucher. I'm committed to partnering with the state to make sure we're bringing that money down here for rent vouchers. Third, coordination between the county and the city. The county does all the mental health, physical, and addiction service programs. I know those programs. I know where the money is because I've been there. The city does the housing piece. We're not coordinated. And it's incumbent upon the elected leadership at the city and county level to be bringing people together on a regular basis, staffs together, to talk about each and every young house person and what the path is going to be that week to move them towards housing and services. I've been at the county. I know how that works. I understand that when you do this, Los should be doing this, but Los isn't doing this. So it's incumbent upon those of us in elected office until Los is reformed to do that work. Fourth, we need more mental health and addiction beds. We simply don't have any place for people to go, and that's going to require state and federal collaboration. I know how to collaborate. I have 20 years of doing the work. Part of combating homelessness is ensuring there is enough housing and shelters available. The 5th District has historically limited the number of units built over the last 30 years. How are you going to change that in keeping it first? Yeah, so I went to Berkeley for undergrad and UCLA for law school. And my first job out of law school was a land use attorney downtown. And uh, part of what we did was um, get housing built. And um, it was often built on your job centers and transportation, which is what we need to be doing here. And so I'm going to lead our district in updating the community plans, which are the, the guiding documents that say what can be built where. We have an incredible once-in-a-generation opportunity to update our community plans in a way that acknowledges that we need more housing, that we have the largest job centers outside of downtown LA, the Century City, UCLA, Cedars, it's almost half a million jobs, and most of the people who work there can't afford to live anywhere near here, which is why we all have country traffic all the time, and the traffic on the west side is so bad. We also have Metro coming through for the first time. We're going to have mass transit for the first time since the red car, which my mom think, talks about fondly from when she was a little kid. We haven't had mass transit on the west side since then. And so, as a ladies lawyer, as someone who understands that you've got the housing and jobs and the transportation and people live, that people living in the housing will actually use, that's what we're going to put in. And it should be focused on affordable and workforce. Market rate housing is going to take care of itself. It's the job of the council member to really focus on bringing resources from the state and the feds down to buy down affordability on otherwise mostly market rate projects. We need workforce housing, housing for teachers, housing for nurses, housing for our firefighters. That's what we need because right now there are so many of them don't even live in LA County because they can't afford to live anywhere near here. And if we want to recruit the very best, we need to be offering them places to live near where they work. And at the same time, it's going to create really vibrant, walkable, lively, wonderful neighborhoods to live in. So I'm, that's what I'm here for. Sam. I want to go back one moment to, to homelessness because Katie talked about her seven years of the county and she knows how to do this work. She knows where the money is. She knows who the people are. She knows how to bring coordination. But in her seven years as senior public health deputy to, to Sheila Kuehl, senior advisor to Sheila Kuehl, homelessness went up 175% under her watch in CD5. That means mental health care was not getting built or streamlined in the 5th Council District. We have 90 beds from 10 million people in the city of Los Angeles provided by the county. Think about that. That's why people fall into jail beds and ER beds. All right. So for a county of 10 million people, the county provides 90 residential site beds. That's why people fall into jail beds and ER beds because the county is not providing health care. You heard about foster care. The county's job is to catch those people, and they're not. And you go down the list, LGBTQ youth and, and domestic violence, there's a unique trauma for each of these populations that the county's job is to address. And they have a $40 billion budget, and they're not doing it. And that's why you're seeing people suffer and wither away and die in record numbers, because the county's failing to provide the services they need on housing. Uh, housing prices on the west side are crushing families. And I think of 
young people at UCLA think of working families, I think of my, my interns and volunteers, how do they can afford to live on the west side, right? And for too long, we haven't built enough workforce affordable housing. Um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit, I'm actually building housing right now on an organization called ETA, which builds housing for adults with special needs, developmental disabilities. We're building 64 units at Pico and Rexford across from Pats. It took us two and a half years to get the departments to just come in and do their inspection and sign the plan check. There was no appeal, there was no opposition. Our city's planning system is broken. Imagine housing for vulnerable Angelinos, and it takes forever to build. So really quickly on what we have to do, we need to preserve naturally occurring affordable housing. That's rent-controlled units. We've got to make sure uh, people who are low-income tenants get the help that they need. We need to convert and acquire housing instead of, build, instead of building brand new affordable housing. Um, we need to adaptively reuse retail commercial office that's never going to come back and acquire hotels and motels. And finally, we have to streamline, streamline the process for building in Los Angeles of all uh, of all types. We do that by hiring more planners, reducing fees, uh, making it easier to, to build, and then transforming our, our, our boulevards where the transit is coming. We need to build a lot more on streets like Pico and Westwood and Sepulveda, La Brea, Beverly. That's where housing should go, and it's going to transform the west side for the better. All right, now I can finally see the timer, so it's over there. <laughs> we were flying in the dark before, so if you guys want to take a look when you, when you want to. Um, one of the pieces of the puzzle that neither of you have really spoken about too much is what would you do to get someone who is unwilling or resistant to get housed into housing? And Sam, you're going to go first. Great. So there's really two categories, well, three categories of people who are saying no to housing. There are people who've been in and out of shelters and had a terrible experience. It's the three P's, according to D.D. Hirsch, pets, possessions, and partners. They want to go with their partner, but there's these are usually, usually single sex shelters that we provide, they can't take their pets, they can't take their possessions, and people are saying no. Or they've had a really bad experience. A lot of the homeless shelters in the city of Los Angeles are dirty, they're dangerous, and people have bad experiences and won't go back. So we need to create more customized, personalized shelters, shelters that are villages. Uh, I think of Westwood Transitional Village on Sepulveda between, West, uh, between Santa Monica and Wilshire. We've driven past it a million times. 40 beds, 40 units, 150 beds, and it's the community's wrapped its arms around it. Uh, there's an after school program, computer lab, preschool, and that's what we need to see. We need to find and build more of these homeless shelters that have become part of the community. Um, the second population are folks who, who want to live outdoors. They come to Venice Beach, it's whether it's the weather, the lifestyle, and what we have to do is find places for them inland, away from our schools and away from our uh, residential communities, where they can do the safe camping. And we can connect them to services and to job training, get their life back on track. And then third, there are people who cannot make rational decisions for themselves. They are so addicted to the drugs on the streets, which are 10 times more dangerous. The fentanyl, the meth, the opioids. We just heard a few weeks ago about that Bernstein High School 15-year-old who's buying per trying to buy Percocet and OD on a, on a sliver of fentanyl. Um, we have to get those drugs off the streets, but we also have to make sure people who are suffering with, with addiction get help faster. And that's why it's imperative to enforce our anti-camping ordinances. That's why it's imperative to build mental hospitals and addiction centers with our resources instead of wasting $900,000 to build a single unit of housing. So we need customized responses for each of these three big categories of people who are saying no to services and treatment and housing. Katie. So just as there's no one reason people become unhoused in the first place, there can't be just one solution. We need a multi-pronged approach. So we need everything from safe camping and safe parking, to tiny homes, to permanent supportive, and everything in between. Part of the reason why we have, a big part of the reason why we have so many people on our streets right now is that we simply don't have places for people to go where they feel safe. When we offer people a place with a door that locks, even if it's a glorified shed, lots of people are taking it. Some people won't. Some people are really mentally ill and or addicted, and they need help. And we don't have places for them to go right now or tools to help get them into that housing, which is part of why I'm really, frankly, excited about the care Corps. They're going to provide a good new tool for us to help get people off the streets and connected to housing and the services that they need. And I'm all for any tool that's going to work, which is why, under certain circumstances, I support the entire campaign anti-camping ordinance, which says you can't sit here, you can't sit here, you can't sit there. Um, the courts have said that you can only enforce 4118, which is the anti-camping ordinance, if you're 
offering people housing or shelter and services. And so I think it's really important that we make sure we actually have the housing available so that we're not just moving people from one corner to another corner, but mitigating their misery and lessening, lessening their suffering by offering them something that actually will, will work, that will allow them to become stabilized, connect them to job training, mental health, addiction services, whatever it is they need, um, and create a path out of homelessness. Um, that's how we're gonna solve homelessness in a real way. It's gonna, like I said before, collaboration is my word. It's gonna require collaboration with the county, the state, and the feds. Because the city of Los Angeles only has a piece of the authorities and a very small percentage of the budget. And so leveraging is gonna be really important. LA business owners often deal with encampments near or in front of their businesses, mentally unwell individuals disturbing and potentially harming their patrons, and unsafe trash. Many receive no response from their elected council members when voicing these concerns. What do you want to tell City Council District 5 business owners? Katie, you first. Perhaps the most or one of the most important jobs of council members to provide excellent constituent services. It doesn't matter what else my office is doing, we'd be coming up with the best policies down at City Hall. But if we're not being incredibly responsive, accountable, transparent, and excellent in providing constituent services, we are failing at our job. And so in the context of homelessness, for me right now, given the massive gaps in our infrastructure around this issue, the council offices are the first and last line of defense. And so my team is going to really be focused on providing excellent constituent services for business owners, residents, um, and really going out and providing stop, providing those stop gaps where um, the county's failing, where the nonprofit providers are failing, because no one's in charge right now. No one's in charge, and that's why homelessness is a problem that it is. You have a bunch of different agencies that have pieces of the authorities, everyone's pointing fingers at everyone else. And until we overhaul the governments, um, we're not going to solve this problem. And I, I want to talk for a minute about governance because I think. It's an incredibly, it's, it's sort of people's eyes goes over sometimes when I talk about governments, but you can't solve a problem if you don't have the right, the right tools and the right mechanisms with which to solve it. And I have experience in, 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 in creating new governments. I took the lead on developing a program called Medicability of the County's Safe Clean Water Program. And it, it stemmed from a need to create coherence and governance around water planning because there were a bunch of different agencies, no one was in charge. And we created a program that um, made coherent governance and now we're actually moving forward and we're creating local water supplies, we're building new parks and open space, we're making us less reliant on imported water. And so what was once a very fragmented governance structure in the context of water policy, I think we can transfer to homelessness policy. And I know that's true because as homeless experts have thought about what comes next after HHH, they actually came to us and said, how do we do this right? We heard that you did it really well in the water contest. Sam. So the outline of a plan that Katie just described what we're doing, which is tax us and create a plan and no one is being held accountable. That was called Triple H. Now there's something called ULA on the ballot, which is eight times bigger, a real estate tax uh, to fund homeless housing in Los Angeles. And what we don't need is more money. We don't need more bureaucracy. We need no, don't need more government. What we need is action. And what I'll tell these small business owners, people like Tara who owns the store on Beverly Boulevard, uh, or, or the or Clinton owns the barber shop in Westwood Village, where this has actually happened to, and I've gone and spoken to them, is that things are going to change around the council member. I will show up, my team will be there, and we will say encampments in front of businesses are not going to be allowed anymore. And with all due respect, it's not true that we don't have shelter beds. We have a thousand shelter beds that are, op that are open and available every single night in the city of Los Angeles. It's true we don't have shelter beds for all 44,000 people who are homeless. But we have beds that are empty, and that is a crime. That there is someone suffering in a cold, dangerous street by him or herself, self-medicating, and possibly uh, self-harming, causing self-harm, and when we can get that person indoors, then that's the job of the council member. That is to cut through the bureaucracy, to listen to the, the small businesses, keep them safe, and problem solve. And that's what I intend to do. I made small business support a, a linchpin of my campaign. It's the engine of our economy. It's the 
It's a harness all of our neighborhoods. In Westwood Village, not too far from here, there's a 42% commercial vacancy rate. More than two out of five businesses are dead because the city council has failed us. And it's time for someone to come in who cares, who will help businesses survive. That's why I'm endorsed by every business group that's endorsed in this race. The Chamber of Commerce, the Business Federation, California Restaurant Association, the Realtors, the list goes on. Because I'm a business owner, and if elected, I'd be the only business owner of the 15 council members that oversee our $11 billion budget for 4 million people. We finally need someone who understands business and will be there to fight for small businesses. This is our final question in the homelessness category. A city appointment is four years. Politicians like your old boss, Sheila Kuehl, and Mayor of candidate Karen Bass, have now gone on record saying that homelessness in Los Angeles cannot be solved in four years. What do you say? Sam? What a fatalistic, feudalistic approach to government, right? We're in this to solve problems. If you're admitting failure before you even start, and I don't know the context of those answers, but I'm here to solve the biggest problems, crime and homelessness, and that's what this race is about. And it's about new approaches, it's about change, it's about admitting failure. When Measure H of the county, Prop Triple H of the city, LASA, which is a joint city county agency, have all failed us. It's time to pivot to new approaches. When people like Ron Galperin, our city controller, with a business background, a Jewish community leader who's endorsed me, says, we need to pivot, and he did that six years ago in a Daily News article. Our leaders ignored him because it's too hard to pivot. It's too hard to stand up to the status quo. It's too hard to stand up to the political machine. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing as a candidate and as a council member. And that's what really differentiates us. I'm not from a political family. I'm not part of the political machine. It's time for new leaders with real private sector, nonprofit, and government experience who's actually going to put our neighborhoods first. In the words of Einstein, doing the same thing over and over again is a definition of insanity. And that's what we've been doing over and over again, not just with our policies, but with our policymakers. We've had our musical chairs with our career politicians and their family members and their staffers, and nothing gets better. And it's time for change, right? As, uh, someone asked me tonight to. Uh, why are you doing this? It's because I love this city. My family came here with nothing. I have four young kids. I want them to live in the same vibrant, hopeful, safe, affordable city that welcomed my family and many of us 40 years ago. And so no, I'm not going to say this is impossible to, build, to, to, to fix. We know we have to do. We need long-term, more affordable housing, more earned supportive housing, short-term, more interim housing. And we need more mental health facilities and psych centers. And then we have to move people with urgency off the streets. We cannot allow another soul to perish because of government bureaucracy, and that's what's happening every single day in Los Angeles. Katie. I think we can make significant progress on reducing homelessness over the next four years. I'm not gonna get up here and tell you that I can solve all of these problems on my own. We can't. The city of LA cannot solve homelessness on its own. It's gonna require, like I said, it's like flogging a dead pony, collaboration with the county, the state, and the feds. And I have relationships with folks at the county, elected leaders at the state, and at the federal level. And that is how we're gonna solve homelessness. Not by broad platitudes, but by rolling up our sleeves, bringing together coalitions of people who are clear-eyed about the challenges we're facing, broken systems, and insisting that we work together. The reason I've been successful in creating programs and policies that people have been trying for 30 years to get done at the county was because I created collaborative, iterative processes where people are, who care about an issue come in, get invested, and take the piece that they care most about and run with it. I don't care who gets the credit. And that's really important when you're one of 15 and you're trying to create solutions to hard, politically charged problems. And homelessness has unfortunately become politicized. So much of our local politics has become polarized. And it shouldn't be. Because government at its core, especially local government, is about problem solving. We need problem solvers who come in clear-eyed about the challenges we're facing. No grandstanding, no BS, who are interested in actually solving the problems. I have a track record of using the tools of government in partnership with communities to problem solve. And that's what this job is. Our next category and our final category is anti-Semitism. An estimated 565,000 Jews live in Los Angeles, making the city the second largest in terms of concentration of Jews in the US. A recent study by the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles showed that a majority 
of that population land within the 5th district? What do you see as a priority to best represent those Jewish constituents? It's such an interesting question. You know, there's so many different Jewish communities within Los Angeles with so many different needs. But at the end of the day, I think what is to feel safe, to feel welcome, to feel seen. I think making sure that I'm responsive to the needs of all the Jewish communities of CD5 and beyond, frankly, because I think when you're the council member of the fifth, you're really seen as being the representative of, of the Jews of Los Angeles. Um, but I think, I think public safety and, and, and um, making sure people feel safe going to shul, sending their kids to Jewish school. I, my, my three kids are at Jewish schools and every single day when I drop them off, um, I worry a little bit and that sucks. And I'm sure all of you, when you go to shul or drop your kids off at school, uh, you feel the same way. And, and so really making sure that my office in the city of LA is an excellent partner with our Jewish institutions um, and, and making sure that each of them has the resources they need so that their, their members and attendees can feel safe is, I think, the most important. At least personally, that's, that's what I want to see from my local government. Sam? So this is another issue that really distinguishes us is that I've spent the last two decades in the trenches advocating and fighting for the Jewish community. As a nonprofit leader, I serve on the board of EDA, which I mentioned, builds housing for those special needs in the community. I'm on the board of the Anti-Defamation League, whose job is to fight not just against anti-Semitism, but bigotry of all kinds. I'm on the board of the Jewish Community Foundation, which is the largest philanthropic body in the Jewish community. And I chair a committee that gave about eight and a half million dollars in the second and third quarter of 2020, in the height of the pandemic, tackling food insecurity and housing insecurity. On the board of that set, Legal Services, a Jewish founded organization, provides legal services for low income tenants and other Angelinos who need help. The list goes on on the board of UCLA, UCLA Hillel here in the 5th district, the district as well. So I will be no introduction to the Jewish community. I just, just this past week, got a chance to speak to so many synagogues, and they tell me, Public safety is a top issue. I'm sure we'll get to anti-Semitism. And, and that's a, on the minds of, of every institution. But I've been there doing the work. I served on a committee at the Jewish Federation that lobbied the state to, to deliver more than $20 million in security funding uh, for an organization called JPAC, which is a Jewish lobby for Jewish organizations in Los Angeles. And that funding not only went to Jewish organizations, but to Muslim and Christian uh, schools and, and mosques and churches as well to keep all nonprofits secure because we're seeing hate crimes against all communities going up. And I think that creates an opportunity to link arms with other faith organizations and big faith communities. Um, more than ever, the Jewish community needs partners and allies, not just the government, but the nonprofit sector as well. I have a record of doing that. I've spent 20 years building our community, and I've also built, or built organizations, including the Iranian community, um, but also in the greater community as well, to engage new voices in civic life, Los Angeles reported that anti-Semitic incidents are at a five-year high. What will you do on city council to ensure that you bring that number down? Yeah, so I'm going to continue the work that I began with the defamation league as a board member, but as a council member. So the, the numbers are have real life consequences. And I see my friend Ben Savage, who's a candidate for West Hollywood City Council, he and I were just, were just talking about what transpired on the streets of CD5 in May of 2021. Anti-Semitism on Twitter um, and online became real. And Jewish diners at Sushi Fumi in Los Angeles were beaten up because they're Jewish. Because these anti-Semites were hunting Jews during the height of a, a war in the Middle East. And we need leaders who will show up, as I do, with Council Member Press and the Public Safety Director Red Martin, on site to advocate for the Jewish community. When leaflets were anti-Semitic ones were left outside my neighbor's homes in Westwood, and it's happened in Brentwood and elsewhere. I went to the press, it was interviewed by Fox 11 News, I showed up. And when the crazies online attacked me for being a Zionist, I stand up for, for the USSO relationship. We need leaders more than ever who are going to stand up for the Jewish community, for our values, but also link arms 
with others. In terms of how we actually combat this, first is we need, like I said, police officers. We have 9,200, we need 10,000, which is what we had in the area of We need to have a, a, a fully funded and, and, and a, a force within LAPD, similar to what they have in New York City, that's going to track hate crimes. The end of that mission is doing the work, they're doing the research. We actually need our law enforcement to follow this online because what starts online becomes real, as we saw last year. Uh, and then there are community consequences. Uh, when this sushi movie perpetrators will not be prosecuted by District Attorney Gascon, uh, the Defamation League and I and others wrote letters and advocated for it saying, you must enforce our state's hate crime laws, otherwise you're breaking the law, District Attorney. And ultimately, fortunately, with a lot of people working hard in other faith communities, those perpetrators of that hate crime were prosecuted. So I walk my seven-year-old to school every day, and uh, he wears a kippah. No. And no, oh, you can't hear me. It's on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I'm, I, this is very loud and very quiet. <laughs> so I, I walk my seven-year-old to, to school every day, and he wears a kippah. And it spells for the last couple of years almost like a, an X on his back. And. There are a bunch of different ways we take away that feeling that so many of us are feeling right now. Unsafe. We do it by investing in a well-staffed, well-trained police department, making sure we're partnering closely with them, collaborating, sharing information. It means we're working with organizations like the Jewish Federation that are doing the work of making sure that our synagogues and schools have the resources they need to be safe. It means education. Education is really important, especially in a time like right now when our civic discourse is so uncivil and we are so divided. The hate and the vitriol and the, the level of animosity in our public and civic discourse is at all time highs. And I think we lead by example with that. It's important to lead with compassion, with empathy, but also with strength. Anti-Semitism and hate of all kinds have no place in Los Angeles. This is one of the most diverse cities in the world. That's wonderful. And we need to find ways of linking arms with other groups that are going through the same challenges of hate, like we did last year when we pushed back and said, we really do need to be prosecuting hate crimes, and actually following through and making sure that that's happening. And so I've committed to working with the city attorney, the district attorney to make sure that's happening, speaking out loudly against it, and partnering with our organizations that are educating everybody. So that we need to make sure that as we teach our young kids, they grow up, there is a pain in our hearts. And I think they're thinking a lot about it a lot as a candidate for office, you know, before. And I think that there's a, a huge role for our, our civic leaders, not just for education rolled me right into my next question. A new California law mandates students receive a semester of ethnic studies. Editions of that curriculum have been riddled with anti-Semitism. What role, if any, would you take to amend that new curriculum? I think it's really important that as we teach history, so I, was a, I studied history at UC Berkeley, I studied 20th century black history, and then part of the reason I went to UCLA Law School is because they had um, one of the best critical race studies programs in the country at the time, it was one of the only ones. And so I took a bunch of courses in critical race studies, and it was a really good introduction to systems and what's wrong with our systems. And there's a lot that's wrong with our systems because our country is built on um, slavery, and that has carried through over time. But that's not an excuse to insert anti-Semitic discourse into our education. And we need to be teaching about all of our histories in a way that's fair and honest and true. And anti-Semitism has no place in that. So I think we can be doing it. We need to be mindful. It's the job of the council members of the city of Los Angeles to make sure we're partnering with our state leaders. Um, the organizations doing that work up in Sacramento to be speaking loudly against it and raising our voice and saying, this has no place in our education. Sam. 
Yeah, so for, year, for years I've been involved in the advocacy. <coughs> Can you hear me?
sort of a fancy one, but um, there's a newish restaurant in the village called Violet Bistro, which is really good and it's, it's fancy. You want to go for our anniversary. Um, anyways, it's a lovely day. And I, I forgot to say before we started, rapid fire means just quick. Oh, sorry. No, no, that, that was a good one. Sam. Since, since we're at a synagogue, there's a great new restaurant on Pico called Lenny's Casita, started by an Iranian Italian man, and it's kosher Mexican. It's extraordinary. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sam, this is yours first. Favorite activity to do with your kids in Los Angeles? Take our kids to our parks. I love our parks. I love our libraries. A day doesn't go by that I don't do. A week doesn't go by that my kids and I are on an ending show or at Westwood Park and Pacific. Um, and we have to do a better job to keep the park safe and clean, and unfortunately, not, that's not the case right now. All right, Katie, you're up. The tarpus. <laughs> All right, the next one is your favorite Jewish food, Katie. Latkes. <laughs> Sam? The Persian equivalent of matzo balls, which is called gondis. <laughs> <laughs> My wife makes an incredible one. <laughs> We are just coming off the holiest days in the Jewish calendar. What's one New Year's resolution? Sam? I don't know if it's going to be a campaign, but I spend more time with my kids. It's uh, that those 25 hours phone off with my kids in the temple and just spending time with them was extraordinary. And I've toyed with keeping Shabbat in different ways over the years. And uh, uh, I got my wife and I committed to, to more, more time off. Uh, from the phones and with our families and our and, um, introspection, for sure. Katie? This is rapid fire, right? It is rapid fire. Yeah, my kids. Okay. See you no more. All right, and uh, Katie, what Jewish tenet is paramount to how you lead your life? To go along. Sam? You can save one life, you save the world. And that's really what has to be it. This, can people hear me? Uh, yeah. if, if you can save one life, you save the world. And that's really a central guiding principle of all my policy views. All right, now we have questions from our audience. And this will be our final um, category. From our audience, why are you best qualified to represent the Jewish community? And Sam, I'll give it to you first. We talked about this a little bit, but uh, I'm going to hit the ground running. I, I know every organization, the leaders in our community. I've served on more than 10 different Jewish nonprofit boards over the last 20 years. So for me, there's, I don't need an introduction. There's no learning curve. Uh, and there's no question that representing and fighting for the Jewish community is very close. So, I, uh, so there's no learning curve for me. I'll be ready to hit the ground running on day one to represent the Jewish community in all its different segments and all the different backgrounds and all the different values. And I've done that for almost 20 years as a nonprofit leader. Okay. So over the last 26 months of campaigning, I've had lots and lots and lots of conversations with all sorts of Angelinos and lots of Jews. And I think the Jewish community wants what the larger Angelino community wants, which is for us to be safe, to be healthy, to get homeless people off the streets and connected to housing and services. I have a decade of private sector experience, seven and a half, six and a half years working in government. I understand how government works, how it doesn't work, how to make it better, how to use the tools of government in collaboration with our communities to problem solve. I am absolutely ready to do this job. That's why I've been endorsed by the LA Times, Planned Parenthood, the Sierra Club. Most of the elected leaders whose districts overlap Council District 5 hundreds of community leaders who know me to be a problem solver who knows how to get things done. I'm very ready to do this job. Homelessness is not just a, a, a life, well, quality of life issue, but it's also a public safety issue for residents. How do you plan on keeping city streets clean? We need to be investing in street services. Um, right now we have trash cans overflowing all over the place. Um, we don't have regular pickup in a lot of places. You see business and improvement districts cropping up all over the place to fill in gaps that the city should be doing on its own. We shouldn't require business owners to task themselves to do basic things like pick up trash. And so I'm, I'm going to be working very hard with the departments of the city of LA to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
And you know, I think there's this perception at City Hall that the council district five is wealthy, and so we don't need it, and so sometimes we don't get the services that we should be getting. And a lot of government is about relationships and building relationships. I'm going to have a really, I'm going to have not only the department head of the Department of Sanitation, but also the number two and the number three on speed dial, and making sure that our office is working collaboratively to make sure our streets are clean. And, then, and the bigger issue is that we're getting people off the streets and connected to housing and services. Um, we have to do that with urgency. I know how to do it, and I'm committed to doing it from day one. So we're hearing a lot about knowing the right people, excuse me, and relationships matter. Speak okay, <laughs> so we're, we're hearing a lot about knowing the right people and collaboration. We've seen what that happens, right? When the relations are too cozy and the status quo is uh, is is become static, nothing gets better. And at the beginning beginning of the pandemic, City Hall decided to leave sanitation jobs empty, not fill them when they were available, and calling it a, a pandemic related issue, a budgetary issue, but that's crazy. We are short 500 sanitation workers. Our streets are being cleaned every other week. In some months, that means only twice. And it shows, right? And I'm a believer in the broken windows theory. If you allow small acts of disorder, trash and blight and businesses going under and encampments growing, it leads to crime and it just or have allowed our social fabric to unravel and it's time for someone from the outside who's has long experience like I do building nonprofit housing fighting for tenants leading nonprofits starting and running a business who's gonna come and say status quo is broken let's do the right thing which is hire more sanitation workers and hold each department accountable so it's not about knowing the right person to call it's about will you hold that person accountable and I will can I just say yeah. something because I get one yeah. so the mayor oversees the departments. The mayor is the one who holds the department that's accountable. Just understanding who does what is really important coming into this job. What are your views about LA's eviction moratorium when it should open? Sure. So the, the city council just voted this week to uh, end the eviction moratorium as of January 31st of next year. And what follows is for, for residential a 12 month tail 12 month period by which residential tenants will have to negotiate and work out deals with their landlords and that's the right approach it's been nearly three years since the pandemic began the vis eviction moratorium could not go on forever it must sunset and this you know, as of january 31st with this one year window to follow uh, i would have voted for that ordinance but i also think mom and pop landlords are suffering Oh, thank you. We're going to pass the All right, thank you. Um, so I think the current approach is the right one. Is that vision more term uh, ending as of January 31st and allowing 12 months for tenants and landlords to work out uh, a deal so that no one becomes homeless. The goal of everyone becomes evicted unnecessarily. The goal here of public policy should be to avoid evictions. Evictions are lose, lose, loses. It's bad for tenants, it's bad for landlords, and it's bad for our court system. And that's why we have 90 billion dollars at the state level that we have to invest to keep people in their homes and make sure mom and landlords don't carry an unfair, undue burden on their backs, which is what's happening right now. The majority of the rental units in the city of Los Angeles are owned by mom and pop landlords who own less than 10 units, and they are paying utilities and property taxes, and, and, and many of them are not getting rent, and the state has not made them whole. So I'm going to make sure we find that right balance protect tenants, which I've done as a nonprofit leader with that set of services. That's why I advocate for and believe in the right to counsel for all welcome tenants, but also for mom and pop businesses to make sure we get it right so that no one has to carry the burden of the pandemic so that both mom and pop landlords and tenants are made whole and can avoid evictions. We're sharing the mic now. <laughs> so the question was about ending the eviction moratorium. Correct. So I support what the council just did. Um, I think it was nuanced and thoughtful. Uh, it gives people who uh, owe back rent a chance to make it back over a period of a couple of years. I think that's important. The last thing we want to see is a flood of evictions. The eviction moratorium, no doubt, prevented lots and lots and lots of people from becoming unhoused during the pandemic. That would have been catastrophic. There were problems with how the eviction moratorium was rolled out, particularly as it pertains to small home and landlords. Um, the state had money flowing down to help cover some of those costs, but that state money ended a couple of months ago. And property owners 
and people are told they pulled in the back. Government needs to be stepping in and making um, particularly small and public and what's old. Um, so I support what they just did. And in the meantime, we need to make sure that once the eviction moratorium doesn't, people aren't suddenly thrown into homelessness. The last thing we want is to increase massive with the number of unhoused people on the streets. And so making sure that tenant protections are in place, I think just cause evictions, which is part of the package, is really important. Um, there are a bunch of different ways we can make sure that, that, that tenants um, don't end up out on the street, proactively reaching out to folks who are facing eviction to make sure that they have some place to go or that they can, we can help pay back for it. That's one of the best investments we can make. This will be our final question, and this person was kind enough to write, thank you for being here and for trying to make a difference for you. How quickly do you think your plan to help increase safety and lower homelessness will be felt by your constituents? Thank you. So, part of what we're gonna do, a big part of what we're gonna do, is have strategic, thoughtful, deep street engagement every single day out on the streets of Council District 5 where we're connecting people to housing and services. I think we're going to start to see real results within a couple of months. I think we need to make sure that housing is available. That, right, at the beginning it's going to be vouchers because that's what's quick, right? The next one with the voucher. I think the low-hanging group, people who we can connect to housing and services with a voucher, we can make progress within a few months. And I think it's just going to be cascading because there's going to be Further work that we need to be doing on, on sort of longer term housing, working with the federal government to increase the number of Section 8 vouchers and, and making sure that those are usable by people. And so I, I do think it's, it's really, it's going to be almost immediate. We need to staff up and then deploy people and make sure that we're collaborating with not only the nonprofits that are doing the work on behalf of the county, um, but also with the county mental health care providers. And so I think, I think a couple of months at most. So I'm going to start with crime, because that's on all of our minds. I will do what several council members have done, which is deploy discretionary funding. Council members have significant money available. And you can pay for overtime for police officers in high crime areas, as the Paul Christ did in Melrose. Um, the statistics are plentiful. I've dug into the data. We know where crime is up. We know what type of crimes are happening. There's a pattern. So I will deploy police officers on day one in those high crime areas. West Village is one, Melrose is the other, Palms is in some other areas, in the Council District, and there's other areas too. We can do that on day one. It's a band-aid, but it's a band-aid that could save a life. We went from two homicides a year in CD5 to 20 over the last two years, and we cannot allow that to continue. And we, what we also can do is invest immediately in more technology. Our neighboring city, Beverly Hills, has thousands of cameras and drones as license plate readers. And we have virtually none in the city of Los Angeles. We need to deploy that in areas where there's high crime. We can do that very quickly. That's a resource issue, and it's a great use of the resources. On homelessness, we can also move very quickly. But rather than spending $900,000 for a single unit of housing and taking six years to do it, there are 7,500 parcels of city and county land that are, that are underutilized, including 40 acres at near LAX that we can turn into safe parking, safe camping, and, or into tiny homes. We can do those quickly. A tiny home takes three hours to install, and the material actually costs five or ten thousand dollars. Everything in the city makes it more expensive. But that's the type of emergency approach that we can take. This is an emergency. If God forbid there's an earthquake in Westwood or Palms or in Lebray tomorrow, 44,000 people are homeless, which is the number of homeless in Los Angeles. We would get them all indoors with a female-like approach within 48 hours. That's the approach, that's the intensity, that's the urgency I will bring. The land exists, the money's there, it's just a time, it's just a matter of having the right leaders who are going to work their butts off to get people indoors faster and not waste away our dollars, which is what's happening right now. Uh, can we have a round of applause for the Thank everybody to Katie, to Sam, and to Jackie Karsh. And my last question would be, how do you fix the AV at Sinai Temple? But we're going to talk about Oh, my pleasure. I apologize for all the time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>